For over 100 years, this has been the sound of innovation, creation, and communication. That is, until 2007. The iPhone wasn't the first touchscreen device invented, but it is the one that brought touchscreen technology into the mainstream, where it's now used by millions of people every day. But what technologies enable the creation of the touchscreen? How do touchscreens actually work? And what does the future hold for touchscreen technology? To answer those questions and more, we're going back to square one. For 50 years before touchscreens, the primary user interface with computers was keyboards. Though the technologies seem different on the surface, the similarities between a touchscreen and a keyboard may surprise you. If you take off the keys, you'll see the board. The circuit board, that is. When you press a key on a keyboard, you bring a piece of conductive material under the key into contact with the circuit board, completing the circuit, allowing current to flow, and thus the key press registers. A similar flow of current happens inside a smartphone, except the conductive material isn't a piece of metal under a key, it's the skin on your finger. How is that possible? And it's conducting what to where? You can't see it, but right now you and many things around you are carrying an electric charge. You are electrical. Our bodies are very good conductors of electricity. If you drag your feet across a carpet and get some charge stored up, it can be dissipated when you touch something metal with a sometimes painful electric shock. When you touch your phone, a much smaller amount of current passes, so you don't feel it at all. That's why you can't wear gloves and use a touchscreen device. You're like a piece of plastic coated electrical wire, insulated, not exchanging electrical signals with your phone. However, touch the glove tip of your finger to your tongue and you find you can use your phone again. This works because we know water can be a pretty good conductor of electricity. So if the keyboard has a circuit board, how does the touch screen know where you're touching? Why doesn't it treat the whole screen as one big button? Let's take a look under the glass and see what we can find out. If you tilt your phone just right, or take a look at a disassembled phone under a microscope, you see there's lines in there. Those lines are made of indium tin oxide, a metallic powder used because it's conductive as well as transparent. That's why it's basically invisible when you're using your phone. Essentially, it's a grid of lots of fine pieces of wire called electrodes. When you tap your screen, those wires are what sense the exact spot you tapped. But how? Our smartphone's touchscreen works on one of the fundamental principles of electricity, capacitance. Electricity was discovered in the 1600s, much the same way it's rediscovered today by small children, creating friction and noticing a shock. In the 1650s, the scientist Otto von Guericke was trying to figure out how gravity worked by spinning a sulfur globe and sliding his hand across, seeing if the rotation of the globe would cause his hand to stick. As you can probably guess, he didn't discover anything about gravity that way, but he did notice that rubbing his hand across the globe created an odd cracking sound and a spark. Electricity. A lot of people became curious about that cracking spark. In 1745, Edwald Georg von Kleist, a scientist at Leiden University who saw electricity as a fluid, set out, logically enough to him, to try and capture it in a jar. He knew glass didn't conduct electricity, but water did, so he filled a glass jar with water and hooked it up to a friction machine, similar to Otto von Guericke's sulfur ball, in order to generate electricity. He had some success, but through trial and error found it worked even better when the jar was lined with metal on the inside and outside, forming essentially nested cups. Eventually, he and other scientists found you could remove the water entirely, since the charge was actually being stored on the inside surface of the metal cups. This storage of charge is referred to as capacitance, and the jar the world's first capacitor. Even today, we haven't come too far from the Leyden jar's two metal cups, Modern capacitors are still two pieces of metal separated by some insulator called the dielectric. In the case of the iPhone's touchscreen, the dielectric is a thin layer of adhesive between two sets of metal electrodes. Those layers of electrodes inside the iPhone's touchscreen have a capacitance with respect to each other. So how is it they sense each other and your finger? Think of it like Marco Polo. Picture a group of kids in an indoor pool. The kid calling out Marco represents our touchscreen system. The kid shouting Polo represent touches. When the pool's empty, the kid calling out Marco just hears her own echo back. Marco, 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 Marco. That call of Marco is the Marco, capacitive sensing Marco, module inside the touchscreen, sending out an oscillating Marco, voltage Marco, signal Marco, across the top layer of transmitting Marco, electrodes, Marco, Marco, which interacts with the bottom Marco, layer of receiving Marco, electrodes Marco, through their Marco, mutual capacitance Marco, to cause a predictable Marco, waveform to result. Marco, Marco, when all it detects is the baseline Marco, voltage, Marco, it's expecting Marco, that's the same as the Marco, echo of Marco. Marco All's well on the Western Marco, front, no Marco, touches detected. Marco, Marco, the system runs these checks fast. A kid can only call out Marco maybe once per second, but the touchscreen system is shouting this every few hundred milliseconds. That is, until Marco, 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 Polo! A touch. 
Some of the current that usually goes from one electrode to the other has been siphoned off to your finger. But where exactly on the screen? The system measures the self-capacitance of each individual x-axis and y-axis electrode to see if any deviate from the baseline expected. The x electrode and the y electrode that don't match the baseline frequency is where the touch is located. It's a fast and simple system that works well when there's only one touch, but things get more complicated when there are two more touches. In Marco Polo, where there's only one person shouting polo, they're easy to catch because you hear one voice and you can swim right to it. But with two or more, you need to do some triangulation if you want to get both. Self-capacitance registers touches by individual electrodes. So if there are two touches, then four electrodes will report back with altered waveforms. But those four electrodes have two different pairs of nodes the touches could be on. So where are the touches? Can you figure it out? No? Neither can the self-capacitance system. And actually, that's fine in many cases. The original iPhone was limited to this system. Pinch to zoom and two finger scrolling work fine since what counts is the movement of the points rather than their actual position. But in order to develop true multi-touch or what's called all points addressable multi-touch, a more nuanced system is needed. Instead of just testing individual electrode self-capacitance, the mutual capacitance of pairs of electrodes are measured. Mutual capacitance is employed only on the electrodes where needed. It's a more complicated and time consuming system since there are exponentially more nodes than there are electrodes. A system with as few as 100 electrodes would have over 2,000 nodes. In our two-touch scenario, the first of the two receiver electrodes are isolated, then the two transmitter electrodes are tested against each in turn. Whichever one has the higher frequency and is consequently the slower to report back is the one with the touch. Then the measurements are repeated on the other electrodes, although in a two-touch scenario it's a foregone conclusion. And now your phone knows exactly where your fingers are. All of this is accomplished in a fraction of a second so that you can play a game on the toilet. This is only one version of the touchscreen technology available, and a simplified explanation of that. As touchscreen systems get faster and more precise, the technology fades into the background. So what does the future have in store for touchscreens? Well, if we asked Otto von Guericke or Eduard Georg von Kleist what the future of their inventions were, they'd have no idea they'd contribute to something like a touchscreen smartphone. Brilliant individuals can stumble upon high-concept innovations, but it takes the creativity and demand of the masses to drive novel applications. So it may be that the future of what's possible with touchscreen technology may lie less in what's behind the screen than in what's behind the touch. Next time on Square One. Now that we know how a touchscreen works, what about the rest of a smartphone? You talk to it, it understands you. You pull up a map, it knows where you are. You make a phone call or search for a restaurant and it wirelessly connects you to what you're looking for. If you comment, like, subscribe, and share, we'll investigate all these technologies and more when we go back to square one.